Let's talk a bit about a home automation thing. Now I've had it in my head that I should do reviews of home automation products because I feel like it's often frustrating to get good information about some of the uh, kind of weirder things that you see for cheap online. But I'm not really going to call this a review because this thing's pretty old. Uh, I'm really, I'm, I'm in a mood to talk about this because I hate it and I'm getting rid of it. That said, EOTech, they're actually still selling this. So this is still something that you might be considering if you are looking for this particular category of product. So this is the EOTech Doorbell 6. Now this looks identical. I think it's possible it's actually, for the main unit, at least the same product as the EOTech Siren 6. But this isn't sold as a siren. It's sold as a doorbell. We'll talk a little bit about that. But a little bit of context. I actually had fairly high expectations for this when I bought it because EOTech, they're one of the OG manufacturers of Z-Wave hardware. They've been involved in Z-Wave since the beginning. I often don't love their industrial design, but I feel like, you know, most of their products are pretty solid. So I was sort of amazed how much I hated this thing. Part of that is that I knew that the EOTech uh, EOTech Siren 5 that this replaced in its Siren variant could take uh, custom audio clips. And I just assumed that this would be able to as well. It turns out it can't. That's like a regression from version 5 to version 6. Um, but let's put this in context. What even is this thing? Fundamentally, this is a Z-Wave Siren. So you send a command to it over Z-Wave and it makes a loud noise. It's got like 30 pre-programmed noises it can make. Most of them are horrible. You cannot change them. This version, even though the one before it did, does not take custom sounds. But this version of it is specifically sold as a doorbell. And what that means is that there are these buttons which can be paired to it. Now, these are not Z-Wave buttons. They use, I want to say it's like a 700 megahertz, but I'm not, and I can't get this thing off. I don't know if this label will tell me anyway. Of course it doesn't. There's an FCC ID I could look up if I really wanted to know. But these use some sort of proprietary radio to communicate with this. There's a slightly awkward pairing process to get these linked up. And then when you push a button on one of these remotes, this thing emits a chime, but it also generates a Z-Wave event. And generating the Z-Wave event is really what I cared about because I have a system that I use in my house uh, it's just something that I developed. There are speakers. They're hooked up to, I'm going to throw this around. They're hooked up to an SBC that uses Azure cognitive text-to-speech to do synthesized voice announcements. And that's kind of the, the output mechanism for most of my sort of home automation applications. So I didn't really care that much about this thing making noises. I'll be honest, originally when I thought, I would be able to do custom sounds on this. I did, but as soon as I found out it couldn't do custom sounds, I realized I was never going to use this thing as an actual siren. I was just going to use it basically as a sort of hub for these doorbell buttons, which are fairly cheap. They're fairly long range. They're supposed to have a long lifespan. And uh, this, when you buy the AOTech Doorbell 6, it comes with one of these buttons, but you can pair up to three buttons to it. So let's talk a bit about how this thing works in practice. Well, this is fundamentally a siren. It is built to conform to the Z-Wave specifications for sirens. So something that you'll understand about Z-Wave as you kind of work with more Z-Wave devices is that the Z-Wave specifications are really pretty prescriptive for the functionality that a device offers. So most Z-Wave sirens are all kind of the same as the next Z-Wave siren except for some of them give you some more advanced features, things like custom audio clips, maybe more configurables. This is a pretty basic Z-Wave siren, but uh, because it's made as a Z-Wave siren, that's part of the Z-Wave security kind of category of, of classes, it complies with the Z-Wave security requirements. That means that it has tamper detection. And the way that this specifically does tamper detection is using an accelerometer. So if I pick it up, you will notice uh, it lights up. You probably can't even hear it, but it's making a noise. It's a little funny, the noise thing. Let's Hold on, let me actually turn the volume up on this. Now you can probably hear the noise it's making. 
when I got this, when this was new and I took it out of the box, and I think I might have pulled a battery tab because this has an integral backup battery. That's another requirement for Z-Wave Sirens. So I can actually unplug it from the power supply. It's going to report that it doesn't have power now, but it still works. I think they tell you that uh, the battery on this should operate it for six hours. This is not the noise that I made. When I took this out of the box, pulled the battery tab, and, uh, you know, moved it, essentially... The noise it made, I think, let's see if I, can, if I can recreate the experience that I had when I first removed it from the box. Yeah, that was it exactly, except for, let me tell you, it was significantly louder than that, and it did not stop. It continued for, I think, two minutes. So, uh, I, I don't know. That's honestly, it might be the worst experience. I'm just going to try to change it back to the, the not so annoying sound. Quite possibly the worst experience I have ever had taking a new product right out of box. I could not figure out how to shut it up. It has an integral backup battery, so unplugging it doesn't work. This button by default doesn't silence it. I actually had to sit on it so that I didn't lose my hearing while I got it paired up to the controller and then messed with the Z-Wave parameters to figure out how to get it to shut up. So, there's a lot of weird little nuances to this, and that's part of why I wanted to talk about this thing. Conceptually, it's fairly simple. It's got like eight channels, is that right? It might be nine. Each channel can have a sound associated with it, one of the 30-some, I think, built-in sounds. You can trigger those channels by Z-Wave, and the buttons uh, are, each of them correspond to a channel. So there's just three, each channel, when I say this has eight or nine channels, has a specific purpose. Three of them correspond to buttons that are paired to it. One corresponds to tamper, that's channel two. One of the channels for, I'm trying to think, I think it's channel one corresponds to a general alarm. And the like last three channels I think are specific to smoke, CO2, um, intrusion maybe. You can look at the specs for Z-Wave Sirens. There's a, a fairly standardized set of the uh, siren cases that the device needs to support, and this checks off all of them uh, by way of having a bunch of channels. So let's take uh, a quick look at, at, you know, how that actually works on the computer. We're looking at Home Assistant here. We're paired up to the device, and you'll see this thing, ZW162, is its internal model name if you're looking this up. This thing has like a million entities associated with it. It's got a bunch of sensors and a lot of that's because of all the channels. So all of these, these are volume per channel. As I said, channel two is a tamper. So if I turn that volume up and shake it, it makes a loud noise. But normally, because as I said, I really don't care about the sounds from this thing. I really just wanted to use it as a, a way to get events when these buttons were pushed. I turned all of the volumes almost, but not quite all of the way down. Why did I do that? Well, interesting thing about this device, it is a little bit too smart. If you set the volume for a channel associated with one of these buttons to zero, it no longer generates an event when the button is pressed the volume must be non-zero. So there isn't really a way to get an event from this thing when a button is pressed without having it make a sound, but if you choose one of the quieter sounds and then set the volume to the lowest it'll go that isn't zero, 0 0.01, then you would be hard pressed to notice that it's making a sound. It also does these light patterns um, when a button is pushed, for example. You can actually customize, if we look at the computer, there's a million parameters, and a lot of these, we got to scroll down, are uh, actually about setting up these light patterns. There are light patterns to tell you when the battery is low in one of the remotes. There's, uh, there's kind of a million features on this. Let's round out looking at the, what we see from a software perspective, too. So we have all of these volume settings. This is the volume for each channel. Uh, two is tamper. I believe three, four, and five are um, the, the three, up to three paired buttons. These switches, these are a little funky, and I don't know why it is that Home Assistant is displaying them with inconsistent 
uh, controls. I have no idea why. If you trigger one of these from Z-Wave, this causes it to make the sound associated with that channel. So you can use these uh, entities to prompt it to produce sounds. Under sensors, we also have like an occupancy style. I'm not sure if that's literally what kind of entity this is. I guess sound is actually an entity type, but there are sensors that also will tell you when something has happened. So if I press the button, this says driveway doorbell because that's what I used to use this for, um, will go to detected. And that's really what I was using. That's, that's all I was actually doing with this, right? Is I was just getting that detected event when the button was pushed so that I could use that to trigger another automation. Under configuration, we also have the ability to select the tone associated with each channel. So I mentioned channel two is tamper, so we can set that to klaxon and then shake it. This, that's actually a really, a lot of things about this are just surprisingly poor quality in practice. One of them is the default sounds that it comes with. They are all over the map in terms of how loud they are, and you would have to tweak the channel volumes quite a bit to get a set of different sounds to sound reasonably similar. They're also just kind of terrible sounds, is my recollection. Like, I don't, let's find out what tornado siren sounds like. I'm going to turn this volume up a bit so we can hear it. Oh, that's a lot of fun. If you change the channel when a sound is playing, it mercifully uh, stops. Why do we have all of these idle, uh, idle state entities? I, I don't really know. I often just ignore the extra Z-Wave entities that tend to come across. Diagnostic stuff is sort of our normal items, except for we do get a battery replacement indicator for each of the remotes paired to it. I think that's a pretty good functional tour of this. Conceptually, it is... Can I shut it up again? Conceptually, it's a siren with these extra features that you can pair up to three buttons to it, it's got sounds associated with those buttons, and you can get events when those buttons sound. So all of that said, why did I say that I hate this thing? Well, one of them is the horrifying experience I had when I first bought it. That's, I mean, I don't know exactly what they should have done. Maybe, like, put a shrink wrap license on it that warns you in huge type that that's going to happen. I, I don't know, but it's kind of ridiculous that you take a new product out of the box, and the very first thing that it does is terrify you, and then refuse to stop. There really was like a two-minute nightmare playing out of my sort of desperately looking around my office trying to find ways to shut this thing up because when the volume is turned all the way up, it is very loud. I think I was definitely into, uh, you know, hearing damage on 30-minute exposure territory with how much noise this thing was making. You can see how annoying that tamper behavior is, right? I had it sitting on a piece of furniture and it would make a little noise whenever you bumped the piece of furniture that it was on. So that's annoying. What else is annoying? Fact that this doesn't take custom sounds. Most higher-end Z-Wave sirens do. The EOTech Siren 5 did. This has been replaced by EOTech as a siren. The EOTech Siren 7 is out. Do you think that takes custom sounds? Let's find out. I didn't look that up. How can I load and play custom sounds? Yep, yeah, looks like the EOTech Siren 7 does support custom sounds. So it's just this one that doesn't. And EOTech, I'm pretty sure that they intended for it to, and then something went wrong, and they weren't able to get it working before they shipped it. Because I found some kind of weird stuff on EOTech's website that kind of implied that this did support custom sounds. I think that's part of why I bought it. And I feel like I didn't really get a definitive answer to that until I found a forum thread where someone basically said, yeah, custom sounds have never actually been implemented for this. I think they kind of implied maybe in a future firmware update, but I don't think I should be running most recent firmware on this, and I don't think that's ever happened. So no custom sounds is a big minus. Another big minus, these buttons, they honestly kind of suck. They don't feel very good when you push them. There's just the action's not very positive. I found that they're flaky. One of these, I have a hard time reproducing it, but one of these just doesn't seem to register when you push it sometimes. Uh, you kind of have to push them in the middle. If you push them towards the top or the bottom, it doesn't work. This is just like a flexible panel, but they don't really give you any affordance to make it clear that you have to push on it in the middle, so you might think pushing anywhere would work, and you're wrong about that. And the battery. Remember how I think I said in 
based on the marketing material, the batteries in these are supposed to last for two years or something. I think there's a problem with at least one of these. I know um, one of these I've replaced the battery almost every two months, the whole time I've had it, because that's about when it sets the low battery flag from a Z-Wave perspective. Others haven't done that. I think in general, I have had to replace the battery in all three buttons that I had multiple times. So it certainly is weirdly short. And then one of them, it was just conspicuous. Like, you know, it would, the low battery indicator would come on and I'd feel like I'd just replaced the battery not that long ago. I think when I got these two, both the batteries that were in them had leaked, which was interesting for a new product. I get the impression that EOTech doesn't move very many of these. Um, maybe why these had leaky batteries when they were new, they might have sat on a shelf for a very long time. And it stands out, of course, that they have replaced this as a siren, but there, there's a siren 7, but there's no doorbell 7. They have not introduced another doorbell device like this. So overall, the EOTech doorbell 6, I would not do it. What am I doing instead? Why did I get rid of this thing? I am just using a couple of Zigbee buttons now. They're not even actually buttons that were made for outdoor use, but I think they're holding up pretty well. Um, we'll see over time. I think I had these up for maybe two years. And, you know, to be fair, they didn't break. They continued to work as poorly as they had at the beginning. Um, so we'll see how the Zigbee buttons hold up. But overall, they were cheaper. The thing about Zig, uh, Z-Wave, sorry, I mentioned this in the previous video that I made where I talked a little bit about what's up with Z-Wave versus Zigbee. Z-Wave, I think, still has a fair number of advantages over Zigbee, but one advantage it definitely doesn't have is cost. Just as a general rule, um, Z-Wave devices are relatively expensive. The Z-Wave chips themselves are pretty costly, so that creates a situation where, um, you know, it's not as bad as it used to be. I was about to say that basically any Z-Wave device is going to be at least $40, I'm seeing more like Z-Wave window sensors, that kind of thing, that are $20, even like $18. So prices have come down, uh, but Z-Wave devices still tend to be more expensive and comparable um, Zigbee devices. And I think that's why this whole remote thing is happening, um, where they have these buttons that use a, a different radio protocol to communicate with the doorbell that uses Z-Wave to communicate. These are absolutely big enough to to be Z-Wave devices in terms of battery capacity and everything. I have Z-Wave, I have multi-button Z-Wave remotes that are smaller than these. One of the things I find strange about these is just how large they are. And you'd think maybe they did that for battery life, but the thing is the battery life on these sucks. Like I have multi-button Z-Wave remotes that are smaller than these and that have batteries that last longer. My only like real justification I can come up with besides cost that these would have cost a lot more if they each had a whole z-wave chip in them so maybe the range is longer z-wave's range really isn't great i don't i guess i'd have to look at the spec sheet to see if that's true i don't have a problem with getting zigbee to where my doorbells are located even the one that's actually on a gate in a fence not on like a house door but to be fair i have a small house it's not the most difficult case so i think the reason they did this whole bell button that connects via a different radio protocol to a Z-Wave device thing, I think it was just cost driven. These buttons only cost about $20, which when this was introduced would have been quite cheap for a Z-Wave device. Today, not so much. If you are like me and you want to have a doorbell button that reports, say, to Home Assistant because you're doing, you know, I do push notifications, you're kind of doing stuff like that, a Zigbee button is what I would recommend. I'm just using the Akara mini switches, but there's a lot of Z-Wave but or sorry, I'm, I keep saying Z-Wave button, right? The fact that Z-Wave and Zigbee both start with Z, huge problem. I cannot consistently say the right one. My recommendation would be a Zigbee button. Um, why Zigbee? There are more one button uh, remotes available for Zigbee than for Z-Wave in my experience. There are some Z-Wave ones, but there's just more with Zigbee. They tend to be cheaper with Zigbee. Um, I feel anecdotally like Zigbee tends to be a little more reliable at longer ranges for me. It's funny because factually, I don't know that that really holds up to like the, the measurements, but for some reason, that's what my personal experience seems to be. It might have to do with the specific radios I have or something. 
uh, yeah, so a Kara mini switch, that's what I use. The third reality Zigbee button would probably be a fine choice as well. The thing that worries me about those is just that they are not explicitly made for outdoor use. And when I think about outdoor, you can, you might be able to tell this one's kind of yellow. It's just the ultraviolet exposure has done that to it. This one was on a north, north facing side of the house, so it just didn't get as much sunlight. The thing I worry about is water ingress. I believe, let me check this before I tell you factually, but uh, I do believe that this has uh, like a gasket on the battery. I like how the screws, uh, they stick to the speaker magnets in my laptop. That happens to me a lot if I take stuff apart with my laptop nearby. This thing's a little bit of a pain to get open more than you would think. And I think the reason it's a pain to get open is because there is a gasket. Let's see, yeah. You might not really be able to see. Oh, it popped it out, but there's a silicone gasket there. The, uh, the, the Zigbee buttons that I'm using now, I, I haven't really looked, but I assume that they do not have any waterproofing measures like that since they weren't advertised for outdoor use. That would make me think that their outdoor lifespan might be disappointing. But to be fair, we don't get a lot of rain here to begin with as far as how often it rains. And where I have my buttons mounted, they have at least some shelter. So only time will tell. We'll see if they hold out. But they certainly were cheaper than this thing. And let me tell you, they were a lot less annoying. Because between the tamper behavior and the uh, issue that I've had with, like, the volume can't be set to zero or there are no events, in general, the configuration on this being very confusing... The channels don't necessarily enumerate consistently, so I've noticed before that I've repaired this to Home Assistant, and the channels have been in a different order than they were before. Just lots of little irritations. I would uh, not strongly recommend that you buy one of these. So that's my home automation topic for the day. I am literally about to film another video that I'll probably release. I'm sorry, these are real low effort. I keep saying this, but I've been super busy with work for like months now. Not in a bad way, like we're, we're getting a lot of business. I've got big projects that I'm working on. It's just not had me super motivated about making a video because it's really time consuming to make a good video. I'm just doing a couple of low effort things right now. This is one of them. I'm probably gonna release this at a different time because I'll edit them later, but I'm gonna make a video where I tear this down. You know what this is, it's a TechNet tracker. But let me show you one more cool thing that certainly does not deserve a whole video, but I was kind of thinking about writing a blog post about these years and years ago for, for various reasons. I had keys to a church building, and the locks on that building were electronic locks, but they were specifically Ilco Marlock locks. Marlock was not a very successful product. I have only ever seen it on that one church building. So I don't know, I don't know how widely this was ever installed. I bought this key on eBay for cheap. I would love to uh, get an actual lock as well, but they do not seem to go uh, used very often. You can kind of see why they get built into a building, then some installer takes them out and they throw them away. There's not a lot of like used sales or that kind of thing generally. But uh, I wanted to just briefly show you how this works because it's a pretty cool kind of a unique um, key device. I do not know how good of infrared filtering this camera has, so I'm not totally sure how this will work out. But take a look at this key. I'll hold it up closer and I'll see if the camera will focus. It's the form factor of a conventional key, right? It's made of brass. It's got kind of a normal Ilco stamped bow, although it's a little hefty, but it's got these three black stripes on the blade instead of what you would normally expect. I think a lot of people, if they looked at this, they might think magnetic, right? Just because it's got, it's the black color that we usually expect out of, uh, out of magnetic strips because it's got like iron particles embedded. You can kind of see you insert this into the lock, so maybe it could have a head that reads as it passes by. That was my first guess, I think, when I saw one of these, but that is not how it works. It's actually optical. So we're gonna find out how much infrared filtering this camera has. Oh, I got bad news. This camera has <laughs> real good infrared filtering on it. This is an infrared 
uh, flashlight that I have for various reasons. So let's do this. I am going to rummage in the closet. So this here is an older Panasonic Lumix that I have modified for infrared use. The sensors that are used in digital cameras are all more or less sensitive to infrared light, but uh, having infrared show up in your, you know, visible color images is undesirable. It kind of throws off the color balance. It's confusing. So most cameras have an infrared cut filter, which is sometimes it's, it's actually kind of integral to the sensor assembly. Um, it's like laminated on during the manufacturing process. This is a camera where it is not. It was a, a glass filter that was in the optical path. So I took this camera apart, I removed that filter, and I put this camera back together. So it, it still is sensitive to um, visible light like normal, but it is also sensitive to infrared. So let's see, I just started video recording on that. I'm just gonna show you what I mean. This, I believe has battery left is a not very good infrared illuminator. And this is my infrared flashlight, which works. It's a lot brighter. So you'll notice that that shows up with a purple cast. That's just because of the like relative sensitivities of the, um, the different colors in the imager to infrared light. What I have here is, uh, this is an infrared filter. It's a filter that only passes infrared, so you're going to see nothing, but if I turn on the flashlight, now you can see again, right? Because you are seeing just the infrared light now. So, judging by the fact that I'm going on and on about infrared cameras, you've, you've probably already figured out how, how this key works. Let's take a look at it. I'm gonna use this because it's dimmer and it won't blow out the exposure so much. Ah ha ha, see that? Isn't that fascinating? So those black stripes are like a resin that is opaque to visible light, but is transparent to infrared. And they are, I think, poured into the key over the brass, which in those slots has had holes punched in it. And I don't, I don't think the lock has like a sensor for every hole. I think it does read them as you insert the key as a series of pulses. But that's actually what the lock does is it's optically looking through the key. It's reading where those holes are punched. And that makes up a serial number for the key. And the lock just checks that against an access control list. This concludes our infrared segment. I really hope the camera was actually recording. This camera is, uh, it's kind of weird. And one of the ways that it's kind of weird is that it does not have as obvious of a, you know, currently recording indicator as you would expect it to. It's old though. We'll cut it some slack. So very interesting technology, right? I think the cool thing about it is that it's pretty durable but uh, when these get too dirty, which things that are in your pocket have a tendency to do, it'll stop working. So I remember the experience of having to wipe off my key on my shirt before it would actually open the door. Some people had reliability problems with these too. I don't feel like I ever did. I wonder if it was like sensitive to how consistently of a speed you inserted them into the lock at or something. The, I really like this. I like it because it's sort of clever and innovative, but it didn't catch on. I can imagine a couple reasons why. One of them is, I think, yeah, maybe there were reliability problems. Uh, one of them is, is just that it was kind of weird and people like the interoperability of like prox cards. But uh, most like kind of security people are also going to be looking at this and thinking, well, this key has a, a serial number effectively, which is permanently associated with it and which we could read out, either with a lock or by looking at it under infrared light and, and figuring out the encoding scheme. So that means that this system is vulnerable to the duplication of keys, right? We could read this out. It would be difficult, I think, to manufacture one of these keys, but I can certainly imagine a determined person figuring it out. 
especially because you probably don't need all this complexity, right, to get the lock to read it. You could probably just take like a piece of shim metal, drill the holes in it, and the lock would, uh, would accept that. So yeah, Ilco Marlock, cool technology. If I can ever get a, a working system that I'll make a longer video where I'll, I'll, I don't know, maybe I'll make a little dummy door and we'll, we'll actually get the whole thing working. But uh, this key might be the only, the only artifact of the short-lived Ilko Marlock that uh, I can really produce.